All right. So to share my screen on this Google setup, what should I select down here? Or do you have to give me per permission? Okay. Yeah, I'm looking for the share screen option. Present now. Okay. Okay, fine. All right. I think we'll be in business. Okay. So we're going to talk about how to make a programming language. You are all computer science students or focused on other areas perhaps, but have an interest in computer science. And at some point in your future, you need to understand the lower levels of, of a programming language. So uh, there's uh, more to it than just understanding syntax or having a fancy calculator that processes your input. So I will talk about a kind of compiler called a fourth compiler that has to do with something relatively simplistic in the compiler world. I want to talk about fourth and uh, compile a little bit of compiler paradigm. I'm not going to go deep into compilers. So we don't have all the, that much time. I'll talk about stack machines. These are early types of uh, programming systems that, that relate to fourth also. I'll cover some fourth syntax. I'll cover this version of fourth called EPOP. Let's see if I can go to the next slide. Okay, who am I? I don't know if I've been introduced in the uh, lead up to this meeting, so I'll introduce myself. Um, I've been doing uh, number crunching with uh, financial data for about a third of a century and making Unix and Linux systems to parse through data faster. So I have to connect lots of systems together for something called distributed or parallel processing. And to, to uh, accomplish that feat, I've had to uh, go low into the system, close to the machine, that means. So I have a lot of experience with Unix systems and low level programming. Uh, in that regard. So a language like Python or Java would be a higher level consideration. I'm chairman of the Twin Cities Computer Society, IEEE Computer Society, and uh, I want to encourage you to visit this link right here, students.ieee.org, and get a uh, student rate if you join. You can get a discounted membership fee. I'm a faculty member in the Minnesota State Colleges and University System. Mainly I teach at North Hennepin Community College, but I have experience elsewhere in the system as well. 
and uh, and I'm developing this language called EPOP, which is a type of fork, which I mentioned before. Going on to what fourth is, we'll talk a little bit about its history. This was developed by Charles Moore, or Chuck Moore, I should say. It's what he likes to go by. In the uh, late 60s, I guess it started to gain uh, critical speed or a critical following, probably in the early 70s. And uh, he was a student of McCarthy at MIT in the late 50s. So you can see a, a little bit in the fourth programming language and then its architecture, you can see some influences of McCarthy's in terms of um, how the Lisp language uh, is parsed. And I'll, I'm going to use some words that are kind of esoteric, you know, in computer science. I know you're, you're all a lot younger, so, and you're new, some of you are new to computer science. So if you have, if you have a question, maybe you can raise your hand at the end of each slide and I can try to answer your question. And then we can answer these things like um, in real time so that they, their, your questions are relevant to the context of the slide. So, you know, I say I talk about Lisp, that might be foreign to you. It doesn't mean anything, but that was uh, a language for artificial intelligence, I guess, into the 70s. And there were machines made for Lisp. And you see some reflections of Lisp in Fort. I guess the past decade or so, there's been this concept of functional programming. And you see it in, in Java. You can do a Python functional programming. Uh, you can do some pretty concise syntax with functional programming. It allows you to exercise mathematical expressions with uh, not a lot of space in your editor. But, you know, fourth was functional long before the fashionable trend of functional programming and with a capital F, capital P that we have uh, in recent years. And I back when fourth had these functional aspects to it, or, and it still does, but in those days before there was the definitive functional programming, uh, it wasn't called functional programming. But fourth was certainly functional esque. So oh, any any questions? Maybe I should look at the chat. Okay, I just put my chat screen up. I don't see any questions. Okay, so why fourth? Uh, first of all, compact, concise expressions, as I was somewhat stating. And in fourth, you make functions in a way that are, in these things that are called words. So you can define a routine in terms of a definition of that word. The word itself would be your your calling mechanism to that function body, to the definition of that word. So that's a self-documenting syntax if you appropriately name the words. It's just like in any language. If um, you name the functions appropriately, and your variables uh, optimally, then you don't have to add much extra commenting in your code because the syntax itself or the, the arbitrary names you've given for variables and functions and so forth are going to be somewhat explanatory. But you can do it more with fourth because in fourth everything is a word. And we do have aliases for words like the dot operator and uh, different odd keys on the keyboard, but those are aliases. But you can think of every syntax or function or subroutine in fourth as being a word. Now, I could call fourth only a programming language, but actually it's much more than that. It, it's really also a, 
a an implementation paradigm for putting a language together. So what, what do I mean by that implementation paradigm? Uh, when, when you look at the uh, instruction set for a CPU, you can see it's quite complicated. It, it can be quite lengthy, and it's not something you'd normally memorize uh, because uh, you just refer to the documentation for that. You would you would become versed at the higher level language that the um, uh, that decompiles into that assembly. Uh, but you would normally not write a language in assembly. That's the instruction set syntax for a CPU. Uh, but you could with if, with fourth. What Chuck Moore did in the late 60s, he made it so that you had just a few primitive functions in the chips um, native language in its assembly. And uh, you could bootstrap the rest of the language or the, dic the dictionary, the fourth dictionary from that. So you only needed a handful of, uh, of core host language functions, in, this case, in that case, the host language being assembly. But there are also chips that are geared towards fourth. So it would have an instruction set in its own language for the fourth chips. And it can be its own S in that, or its, its own um, OS operating system, OS in that regard. So you, the language can be defined in hardware or software. And in fact, on some systems, and I guess mainly um, certain servers used in uh, internet service providers and web web services, uh, you do have firmware that's written in fourth. So that's like your your bootloader loads the operating system into memory. Any any questions about? this Y4 slide. So I'm going to tell you a little bit more about EPOP. So Sophie asked this question, tell about EPOP and with the assembly instructions. So a lot of fourth is written in assembly, but you can write this in software. When I say write in software, uh, you can write a fourth implementation in any host language. I could write it in Python, although that would be kind of a a downer because uh, it'd be no challenge to do that. Uh, but I, I'm going to show you how I do this in D. So D is like a version of C++ or an alternative to C++. It's like C with classes. So I'm implementing EPOP in D. And actually, I'll get to that slide in a bit, and then I'll explain why some more things about why D is useful there. So another reason you should program in fourth Develop your mind. I think cognitively, you should use a language that makes you problem solve. As a young person, you should do it. If you, if I'm, I gather most of you here are youngsters <laughs> compared to me. Uh, so this is a great opportunity for you to use tools that make you work hard to um, develop this muscle between your ears. It's, it's too easy to find solutions on the internet for everything these days. And you need, you need problem solving tools. And I would say for older people in the um, later part of their lives, they might benefit from uh, programming and forth the same way that they would benefit from keeping active with say a game of chess on a regular basis, just to keep sharp. So fourth is a nice 
language for, for developing your mind because it's a problem solving language. You have to factor big problems down to small problems, break, break up a, a problem into smaller problems and then therefore smaller solutions. The, the language that lends itself to this due to its nature of defining solutions in words. And I'll show you examples in a bit. So it's kind of a borders on this inductive logic of building a solution of these words. And then you once you can build that with the tools of a computer, like a programming language, you can you can automate a solution. And I'm sure you know how to or you're aware of solutions that are um, things that you can do with say Python and Java. There's all kinds of nifty things you can do with a Raspberry Pi with your computer. But the solutions are out there for Python. So for example, your instructor tells you, here's your assignment, go out and solve these tasks. Work on these tasks, solve these problems. You could go on the internet and find all the solutions that you need for Python, and to a large extent, Java and other languages. You might be able to find them for fourth, but it would behoove you to work through them in fourth. And uh, think of fourth as an understanding of knowledge versus versus uh, uh, Python. You possess knowledge. I, I have this book here, this C book, C plus plus. Now I'm possessing it in my hands. I can always turn to a page in this book and look up a solution or and implement them and then forget them. So I possess the knowledge. Okay, I have it on my head. Or I could eat. I could eat the book. I could possess it in my stomach. It doesn't matter. It mean that I I know it. Okay, you can get it from Stack Overflow. The solutions it doesn't mean you know anything. Or you have come across a problem. There's no solution. You have to work it out. If you've been working out problems on your own for a long time, then it would be second nature to you. So the temptation is to use Python because it doesn't have scaffolding. You can get right to your problem solving. But really, your problem solving is just inserting these possessed tidbits of knowledge. So I, I advocate fourth so you can get on with also developing your mind in that regard. Any questions before I go to the next slide? Okay. So common fourth components. We have a stack machine. This is like a, a data structure. It could be implemented in hardware or software. So if you know about arrays or linked lists, we can implement the stack in terms of a linked list in say uh, Java. Uh, memory is set aside for the, the a program stack that's going to be separate from a data stack. So they can have a couple of interpreters. Instructors are going to be put on a program stack, stack, and when the program executes, they're going to proceed through sequentially through the different components of, on the stack. Those components will branch or have certain uh, representations of, on them, depending on the architecture. You could have a linear instruction set, or you might have a, a syntax tree, and it, it really depends on the type of Ford architecture. So data stacks, fourth typically has two data stacks, and then one program stack, which would be used as your inner interpreter. You've got some global variables that are not on the stack. So those are those are scoped out for the life of the program. So you run a program, you have variables that are initialized outside these stacks, and they exist for the life of the program. Uh, user input is tokenized. So that's uh, you've got a series of instructions input by the user. Each word in the instructions broken into its own token. 
and then that token is uh, uh, processed by an outer interpreter. And that's all before it gets to in uh, the inner interpreter. So Sophie has a question. Um, so is scaffolding code is used to set up our pro program? So, um, so the scaffolding I referred to in that prior slide, down at the bottom of that prior slide. So you often have a number of header files, like imports, like in Python, you have imports or in um, Java, and C have pound include and so forth. And uh, those header files usually exist just to get your, your environment set up to where you can do anything useful. So for example, memory management, um, file I.O. and uh, the containers of your, your, your data structures, like if you're creating a stack, you know, what's that going to be, be actually comprised of? Is that going to be an array? So you maybe import the scaffolding for that array structure. So it'd be a library. Uh, various libraries in overhead code would comprise that. That scaffolding is really slang. <laughs> That's my slang word. For, and I, I'm not the only one to use it, but it, it's a slang word for um, the overhead that you need to do what you really want to do. You want to get to problem solving. I hope, I hope that answers that question. Okay, I'll go on to the next. Yeah, just let me just gloss over stack machines. Um, there's probably a lot more that we could cover here. But um, stack machines, you think of a stack as like a cylinder where you can put some marbles down in the cylinder. And the first one you put down in the cylinders, if you take the, cylinder, the marbles out, it's going to be the last one you can take out. So it's a last in first out setup. So if you put data on that, then the first element you put in the in this container is going to be the last element you can get out. And the beauty of a stack machine as such, with this LIFO, last in first out, is it forces us to um, exercise a certain scoping. So if, if, like if we want to have a scope for um, functions, we put functions on the stack. If we put one function in there, we have to take care of that function data and variables before we do anything else. We can't commingle other function variables in that stack. At least uh, not uh, implicitly. We could do some fancy uh, coding to, to violate the stack, but it, with the stack, we get the scoping we need. And we've got a stack counter. That's like our our keep uh, a pointer to the top value on the stack, the top element. We've got a program counter that does something similar for the uh, the program stack. We've got a stack pointer. So Caitlin's asking, is this being recorded? I yeah, I think the hosts of your your uh, group are recording this. Then a couple of the methods that you see or functions are going to be pop and push, and these these would be a couple of the functions that comprise the uh, host language functions that can be used to bootstrap the rest of a fourth language. So you'd see those implemented in the primitive or host language at the lowest level, possibly in assembly. In my case of EPOP, they're implemented in, in uh, D, the host language. So push pushes data on the stack, pop pops it off the stack. And then when it's popped off, it's either going to a return address, that could be a register, or it could be another stack another data stack that just keeps track of the prior returns. It depends on the fourth architecture. 
And I think your first stack machines, they go back to like the earliest computers. Any questions about stack machines? So this is what's happening. Here's an illustration. When you put data on the stack, when you push it on, so we, we push a ninth value on, then uh, it's going to go to the second column here. And I hope everyone can see my screen or this uh, slide that I'm sharing. If you can't see the slide, uh, please let me know. I would hate to have been talking this whole time and not sharing the slides. Great. Okay, you can see it. Uh, you can see that as items are added to the stack, then the stack pointer increments upward. So in reality, the stack pointer is going to relate to program counter and those might be one and the same or the program counter is going to be used to in, as an index for the stack pointer and with instructions when as instructions are processed that stack shrinks so at the end of uh, an expression entered by the user that um, if that were a program stack, there would be no items left on it. And any questions about that last slide? So one one of the beautiful things about stack, I'll just you know using a stack like this. One of the beautiful things is you know, apart from that scoping, you have an enforcement of uh, operation for post fix. So the typical math you are used to as a uh, operator in the middle of the operand. So for example, we say one plus two, you know, we want one plus two equals three. And our, um, Our operand is in the middle. We call that infix. With um, postfix operations, and you also will see this on a calculator. Like I've got here's a an old HP RPN scientific calculator. There's no equal sign on here. It does everything in reverse Polish notation. This is postfix, where the uh, the operator comes after the operands. My wife hates this, this calculator because there's no equal sign. And most people don't use something like that. So that's understandable. So um, if you look at this slide here, and I've got a snapshot or a screenshot of the uh, EPOP operation. So the numbers one and two go into the stack in that sequence. And in this case, I've got that um, half quote. What that does is it, it puts the following operator on the stack. So we can, with, with EPOP, we can put a number of different things in the stack, strings, characters, operators and so forth then we can ex execute whatever's on top of the stack with the exec word or function this dot operator after exec what that does that emits the top of the stack it's like it pops it to the screen and that CR just means carriage return. That just like makes a new line. So this is basically fourth, the version of fourth called EPOP that you see in the 
small screen there. Any any questions about that? So it pops a lot like four. That's three stacks instead of two, however. Uh, accommodates strings, tables, and XTs. Those are execution tokens. Those are the um, the instances of the words. So if we have the words in a linked list, those would be the equivalent of a node in a linked list that has the ex executable function. So Caitlin asks, what is EPOP used for? It's used for teaching and development. So I can uh, do things like um, get stock quotes from it. I can I can create a database, relational databasing, uh, and so forth. In fourth, you can basically create anything you can make in C or in Java. So if you look around at some of the recipes available in fourth, you'll find things for like chess games, uh, artificial intelligence, neural network. So what is the difference between EPOP and fourth? EPOP is a version of fourth. It's kind of like, um, there are different versions of Java. I think there's like two, like there's an open source version, then there's the Oracle version. Uh, there's different versions of C. There's Objective C, there's ANSI C, and so forth. And if you're interested in seeing the host language of uh, EPOP, go to dlang.org. And that's a really good language. If um, if you're interested in C++, uh, there are a number of advances that D made uh, that I think C++ borrowed from D with uh, C++ 20. You can make your own words in EPOP. And you can use uh, SQLite, that's a version of SQL. And you can use curl, that's for networking, through D's application interface. So Caitlin asks, what's D? That's a programming language. So it's, uh, I guess, the next best thing, or I guess it would be called a competitor to C++. So what led to the development of Forth and EPOP? So Forth was uh, made for driving uh, radio telescopes back in the 70s, late 60s. So that was its big use for National Oceanographic Association, NOAA, or National, I'm sorry, National um, Telescope. NROA, National Radio Observatory Association. So big uh, government telescopes were being run by Forth. Now there's a lot of different Forths, and EPOP is one of many. And uh, I guess you can find some really interesting stuff if you look up. Ch uh, Chuck Moore and Forth on the internet. You can read Wikipedia about Chuck Moore. I think you find it interesting. So here's another example. I could put data on the stack. This will, this will work in EPOP or Forth or any version of Forth. So we could put the numbers one, three, five, seven, nine on the stack, and you see they they go on the stack 
with the first being one. So you can think of that as being the bottom of the stack. And we can display that with this dot S. Okay. Here we're just for uh, edification, for our own uh, educational purposes, we're, we're displaying the index of that item and the address in, in um, memory. Any questions about that? So using that, that same data, we can sum that up. Here we can take this um, plus operator and put it into these curly brackets to make a lambda expression. That's just a nameless function. We could store that or we could uh, call it on the fly. So we're using this GSC symbol here. That just is a getter for the stack counter. And we decrement that by minus by just one because we want to do four additions, not five. And we repeat that addition of items on the top of the stack four times. That gives us the value 25. So that's a basic addition. You could take that same expression. So here's that expression with the, that curly brackets here. We can take that same thing and put it in a word so that we don't have to keep writing that out. So it's here are effectively defining a function called sumdat. And we, we tell the system we're defining a new word by putting a colon here. And we terminate the definition of the word with a semicolon. And we put some odd data back on the stack and call the sumdat word or function, if you will. And using the dot and the CR, we can see what that result is. So that odds word here, that just puts 13579 on the stack. I defined it earlier. We could also, uh, so here, some that was put on the program stack, but we could have alternatively put it on the uh, data stack because we can put a number of different elements, different element types on the data stack, including execution tokens like some data. And to execute it now, we have to use this exec word down at the bottom here. But, you know, we could define things to save on typing code and, and, and enhance code reuse. Sometimes just putting things in function definitions or word definitions is not enough. Sometimes we need to make a program. So like we could have a file that contains a program. For example, here's a program that prints ASCII code for the letters A through Z. You know, this is a, ASCII is a, subset of the, nowadays a subset of the Unicode table, which you should all learn about because Unicode is implemented by all computers, all programming languages. But we can just see the uh, 26 letters of the alphabet, uh, the capital letters that is. With this here, we define a few words, one called tab, one called HDR for header, and one called ASCII row, that's going to emit the rows. So that's a, a nice, concise program here. We're going to call these words on this last line here. We're going to call 
start at the base of 64 with the base number. It's not base 64, it's the base. It's, it's the starting index of our program. We're going to use this lambda expression 26 times. We're going to do this thing called lambda repeat or L repeat 26 times to exercise that program. Yeah, I'm told we have five minutes left. Okay. Let me just show you what that program does. He emits that to the screen. So you can do this in a lot of languages. Here are the user words. And uh, that I've defined earlier. And let's see what else. Here's factorial. Let me just talk about factorial. You all probably learned the obligatory factorial. And we can we can do some factoring. No pun intended with factorial. We can take fact as a word we want to break up into two subcomponents. Map and reduce. These are some esoteric words that you'll learn later on if you haven't already. And um, we're mapping across a series of uh, places in the stack, and we're reducing from those places to get a final result. We get five factorial with a single execution of that lambda expression. It's just five, and that's the end of the slides. So I wanted to hurry up with these last couple of slides uh, because we only have a few minutes left, but now I can I can go back and readdress any of those slides or add, answer any other question for you. And also, clear screen if you like. Here's the actual ED evaluation print loop of uh, EPOC. I can add code and then you set it to recompile the new code. Anyway, any any questions for me? I think we got two minutes. Well, thank you for hosting me. I enjoyed talking to you. Do you what would you like me to go or be in your class picture? <laughs> You have me pinned? What does that mean? <laughs> oh. Oh.
Thank you. Bye-bye.